Good morning, good afternoon uh, to those of you on Central Time. My name is Jonathan Schoonover. I'm the Senior Vice President of Strategic Practice for Tennesseans for Quality Early Education. And you're tuning in to another Bright Start Tennessee Lunch and Learn. Uh, excited today to talk about child care policy changes that are coming to our state. We'll just jump right in here as we do our intro, uh, as we start this out each time. Again, Tennesseans for Quality Early Education is a nonpartisan coalition of advocates for Tennessee's youngest learners. This means that we're focused on advancing state policies and practices uh, that ensure that all Tennessee children from birth through third grade get the high quality care and education that they need to power our state's future. Uh, as a part of this, we started the Bright Start Tennessee Network, which is a statewide network of community partnerships that's really focused on closing achievement gaps and opportunity gaps uh, for children birth through third grade. We are growing. Uh, we are a growing entity and network that is is expanding. We now have uh, eight different communities that are participating, regions across the state that cover sixty two percent of the state's population. Excited to kind of expand this work as we continue to grow. Uh, we are the work that we do is focused on kind of that whole child with that north star of birth, um, or sorry, that north star of third grade reading and math proficiency. Uh, but to get there, we know that it requires kind of focusing on the whole child, and that includes high quality birth through age eight learning environments, physical health, mental health, and development all being on track beginning at birth, and that we're focused on supported and supportive families and communities as well. And as a part of this, we have kind of a framework that includes 15 measures of success. Uh, within these 15 measures of success, we've got each of those three learning domains or th three domains covers five measures of success. And we've got working groups that are focused on that. And we have spent a lot of time developing our Bright Start plans um, in the communities focused on this framework. Today, we're excited to introduce to you I, a guest speaker that's going to, Blair will will do the full introduction, but Grace is, has been a friend of, of TQE for a while, uh, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about some of the coming child care policy changes um, to Tennessee. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over now to Blair. Uh, I'll spotlight you and I'll spotlight Grace, uh, but I'll let you do the intro uh, to Grace. Well, hey, everybody. Um, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are in Tennessee. I'm Blair Taylor, and I'm the CEO of Tennesseans for Quality Early Education. Delighted to have y'all all here with us this morning and delighted especially to have our friend and colleague Grace Reef with us. This came up. Um, so the topic today, child care policy change, specifically very much focused on the Child Care and Development Fund and the federal rules that govern that and also the sort of blend of federal and state decision making that's going to be impacting um, the use and deployment of that big bucket of fund, that child care and development fund, those big bucket of child care funds, child care subsidies, child care vouchers, certificates, um, whatever, whatever term you use, um, that is the largest funding source for child care in Tennessee, child care subsidy in Tennessee. So with that, the way we're going to do this, I'm going to just quickly introduce Grace. Um, she's got some slides that are densely packed with information, but we're going to make this very conversational. And so she's going to be going through some of her slides. I'm going to be sort of prompting and asking her questions to keep it conversational and to sort of draw in some sort of Tennessee information. Uh, Grace is a real expert on the federal side of this. Um, and, um, and I'll be able to bring in some information on the, on the state side. And then she is, um, we are open to questions. So be putting your questions in the chat as you have them. And I'm just gonna watch the chat and try to pull in those questions as we see them. And we'll also just carve out time in the end for some Q and A, uh, but again, we wanna make it conversational. So, so please feel free to do that. So let me just first say about Grace, she's been working with us and been an advisor with T to TQE for a while and friend. She, um, works primarily with an organization called the Committee for Economic Development of the Conference Board. It's a national organization of uh, businesses and business executives who are have focus on many issues affecting business, one of which is early education and, and for this conversation, apropos this conversation, childcare. So we are uh, we're, we're grateful uh, for the time that uh, CED uh, provides of, of her to our, our work, and, and we're grateful for Grace. So 
With that said, uh, Grace, let's dive in. You can start showing your slides now if you want. I know you've got just a quick one that you want to show on the conference board and CED. And then we'll dive into the meat of the of the topic of the conversation. There we go. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to join you today. Um, I have a quick slide about CED, business-led, nonpartisan business-led organization with over 50-year history in supporting early childhood education, child care, Head Start Pre-K, uh, basically employers are the ultimate consumer of children as they progress through life. And so early childhood uh, has a huge impact, what kids learn and whether they're ready to start school, ready to succeed. Also, Grace, I just noticed, and and for the group, y'all probably noticed there is a translation going on at the bottom of her screen. Uh, Grace does periodically has multilingual audiences for her work, uh, that it, it, Spanish speakers and English speakers. And so she's got that rigged in and we thought, uh, we thought that'd be kind of neat to leave up. <laughs> Thanks, Blair. So today we're gonna talk about the child care and development final rule. Um, a little bit of context and Blair kind of led in with that. There is a federal law, the Child Care and Development Block Grant, that sends money to all the states for child care. And um, that money, as you know, is super important to both strengthening the quality of care and helping low-income families access child care. Well, when states apply for the funding, there are some rules to go by. And those rules um, guide how the money is spent, what investments can be made, and states every three years put together a state plan. And in that state plan, um, it's actually a 118 page template, all these questions that states have to fill out about what their policy is. Um, that's what guides the program. So when I'm talking about the CCDF final rule overview, what I'm talking about is there's been some fine tuning of those rules and some states may be doing everything already. Other states may have choices to make or may, um, you know, uh, decide on some new innovative strategies. And this rule overview is going to tell you, hey, what's new? What does that mean for states? What choices do they have? What new requirements may be that they have to take into consideration as they design their program? So overall, this is an updated rule. It's not like a brand new rule. Actually, uh, the Child Care and Development Block Grant was first enacted in 1990. So there have been rules for quite some time now. And every now and then, Congress passes legislation and those, those rules get updated. In this case, the most re recent rule update is really related to President Biden charged all the uh, federal agencies to look and see within existing authority, what more can they do to help families access child care, to help providers participate in child care subsidy programs? What, what can they do to expand parent choice? And so the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, they took that seriously, and they looked at their current authority, and they came up with a proposed rule, was, which was back in July, and they made uh, put it out for public comment. There were tons of comments. Six months later, another revised rule was released in January, and there were additional comments. And now a final rule was issued March uh, 1st. What it does is lower costs for families. It increases options for families about child care within their community. It strengthens payment practices for providers. Why? So that providers will participate in the subsidy program, which helps low-income families uh, get and keep their job because they, uh, a subsidy helps make child care more affordable. And it makes enrollment in the subsidy program easier and faster for families. I mean, it seems like, well, of course, it should be you know, easy and fast to access subsidy, but actually that varies by state as to what those rules are. So this rule hopefully uh, will encourage states to look at ways to make applying for subsidy easier for families and the turnaround time for when they get those subsidies to be faster. Um, 
The effective date of this rule is April 30th. So that's just a few short weeks away. And there are some new requirements, which I'm going to go through and explain. Um, states, if they are not already doing some of these newly required things, can ask for a waiver up to two years. Not like a blanket waiver for everything, but section by se section. If they need a little bit more time to come into compliance with that requirement, they can ask for it. But it's a one-time waiver. This is not like you know, uh, forever. This is a one-time waiver. It's up to two years. HHS explained in the rule process, it's called a preamble, that they're going to be monitoring it. They want to see progress. They don't want to see some blanket waivers with no state action. Um, hey, Grace, and also yep. I know just a, a, a thing you and I talked about, some of the new rule has is about requirements and things that right. must be done. And then some of the new rule is about encouragement Yes. And things that must be done. And I know you're going to touch on that, but I just wanted yes. to highlight that. Definitely. Pieces of the new rule, some are new requirements. Some are options for states. Some are clarifications, maybe areas in the previous rule that states may have either been confused about or not fully understood. So I'm going to go through each of those. Um, but hopefully the bottom line is more choices for parents. Um, this final rule it applies to the child care state plan that's due July 1. Every three years, the state has to put together a plan and submit it. I heard Blair mention, um, you know, uh, hearings and that the, you know, state plan is being currently drafted by the state. That is true. And at the end, we're going to talk a little bit more about that state plan process and hearings and how to maybe have some input into things that the state is deciding. For more information, I've just included some links. I'm sure Blair will send out uh, a link to the slides so that everybody has them. Um, and you can see we've got you know, a link to the final rule if you want to read the whole 50 page thing. And if you look at this screenshot of the very first page, it's 50 pages of that three column tiny print. So it's a lot. Second, I've done a rule summary. That's only four pages. Four pages is kind of a lot, but compared to the 50 page text, not really. And CED, uh, Tia Collier, who's on our early childhood team actually drafted um, kind of a background, a policy backgrounder, which is additional context for some of these requirements and options and clarifications. And so I put a link to that. Next, okay. So childcare affordability. I think everybody knows whether you're a low income family or not, Child care is hard to afford. It's expensive. If you have more than one child, it's super expensive. So what HHS, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, did was they, they looked at what states are doing, you know, across the country. And they saw that the copay, here's how this works. There's a, a family gets a subsidy uh, to access child care. And there's a copay means, you know, if you're under poverty, uh, it's free. There's no copay. As your income goes up, usually the copay goes up. And so it might be 2% or 5% or 10%. In one state, it's 27%. goes up to 27% of income. And they said, hey, what we're trying to do here is make child care affordable. And we want to make sure that copay is not a barrier. Sure, it makes sense that there's a copay that increases as income increases, but let's be realistic here. You know, we don't want the copay to be a barrier. So what they did was they set a 7% cap on the amount a family would have to pay in copays. That's not a per child cap. If you've got two kids, it's not 7% per kid. It's 7% of income for the family. And so- That's right. The result, yeah, Grace, I was just going to mention in Tennessee right now, the way it's working is that 7% has been a recommendation of the federal government for a while, but it's not been a requirement in Tennessee. Um, currently, the way uh, our Tennessee Department of Human Services has approached it is that the 7% was the cap for the first child, but it's been increasing thereafter for additional children. And of course, that that will be a very big and significant change in Tennessee. It'll be huge. But kids live in families. So it makes sense that the copay is by household, not per child. Um, now, having said 
that there'll be a 7% cap on households, on families, states can always go lower. So the 7%, um, that should be looked at as a maximum. And states are really encouraged to review affordability and set those co-pays lower uh, if they want. But it is a choice. It's a requirement for the 7% cap. It's an option for states to set those uh, co-pays at a lower level. Next, I want to talk to you about co-pay waivers. What is that? Um, the final rule allows states flexibility so that in some cases, there's no copay. And that's under the theory of if we really want to expand choices for families and really make sure that parents, particularly low wage parents, can get and keep a job, that those copays don't become a barrier. So, in some cases, here's what HHS is saying. Currently, at least before April 30th, mm -hmm. um, any family with income at the poverty level or below, no copay. Now, what they're saying is hey, any family with income, to 150% of poverty, you don't have to charge them a copay. It allows states to say no copay for those families at 150% of poverty or below. Also, states have, uh, have additional flexibility. If you have a family with a child who has a disability, no copay. And that's for the family, not just for the child who has the disability. Um, a child in foster care or kinship care, no copay. Families experiencing homelessness, no copay. Families with a child enrolled in Head Start or Early Head Start, no copay. So what HHS is really saying is, you know, instead of uh, writing and asking HHS for a waiver for some category of children to not have a copay, states, we're going to give you these categories, and you don't even need our permission. If you want to put in your state plan that you're going to waive the copay for families in these categories, go ahead. But they also say if you have other categories that are priorities in your state and you don't want to charge those families a copay, you can do that too. So, for example, in some states, if you're a teen mom, um, as long as you're in school, they don't charge you a copay because you know what? The greater good of it is that teen mom is going to stay in school and that copay she might otherwise be charged won't be a barrier for her child to be in high quality care. So these are policy decisions, but they really impact families. Um, the last right, thing- Grace, I might just add on that too, that sure. again, as you all are thinking, bear in mind that, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna touch base at the end on what is the input process and DHS will have an input process. And, you know, we, we want our advocates to, to make your voices heard in, in that input process. And so, um, they have mentioned that this is an area they're exploring, and I know I know would be eager to hear from everyone about this uh, and all of this. But. Great. So just to make sure that the whole copay thing, the seven percent cap, the copay waiver, you know, categories that would not be charged, categories of families that would not be charged to copay, just to make sure that the public knows about it, because it's no good if someone in some office in a state building knows that this is the rule unless families know it, right? So the final rule requires states to post this type of information on their website. So it's publicly available and easy to understand. So if I live in Tennessee and I um, wanna know more about the subsidy program and I wanna know what are the rates and what can I expect it to be you know, paying as far as a copay is concerned, I can go to that web page and it's ex 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 uh, publicly explained to me in an easy manner. And so that's a new requirement because in some states it wasn't posted and it's confusing and what is posted might be a chart, but maybe you don't know how to read the chart. So all of these things are designed to make understanding the program easier and to make applying easier and to make sure that the whole copay is not a barrier to accessing the program, which is designed to help families uh, access childcare. All right. So expanding parent choices and provider stability, what is that? Um, the first thing about it is that uh, the new rule 
updated rule requires states to use some grants and contracts for slots for children. What does that mean? Um, currently, there are many states that offer, you know, a voucher certificate and a family can choose where they want to go. Um, in a handful of states, they also do contracts with providers. So they take some, the state takes some of that subsidy money and among community-based providers, they enter into a contract for maybe a certain amount of slots or maybe to um, make accessing infant and toddler care easier or, you know, care for children with disabilities easier. Um, so instead of a handful of states doing that, HHS has said, we're going to require all states to use at least some of their child care funding to contract for slots for kids in these three areas, in underserved areas in the state, for infants and toddlers, and for children in, with disabilities. Um, and so some is not defined, so I can't get specific on that. I think that will be up to the state. But I do think it's a huge opportunity for states to really work with community-based providers to figure out how they can better serve um, infants and toddlers and kids with disabilities. And sometimes a voucher may just not be enough. For example, let me give you an example. You have a child with disabilities. That child may need some extra attention, some extra services. Maybe you need another staff person in the room. Those are things that are not typically covered by a childcare certificate or voucher. But if you have a contract, maybe that contract would enable you to have an additional person in the room so that the needs of all kids are met. That's kind of how you might wanna look at a contract. Grace, also I would just say about that, <clears throat> predominantly in Tennessee, it's, while there have been some contracts, but the predominant way of deploying our funds in Tennessee are through the voucher or certificate program and the way that our state has Sort of incentivized providers uh, in childcare deserts or for infant and toddler care or otherwise has been through just adding sort of a bonus, a 15% oh, bonus sure. on the reimbursement rate provided to provider for the voucher. But I think, you know, I'm certainly of the mind and, and I have, have, have heard, you know, many in the childcare community speak about the benefit of having contractual relationships because it creates such, for the provider, it can create such greater stability um, and the ability to plan and anticipate enrollment and also any kind of special services, as Grace said, that need to be built in. So uh, just uh, this is ex really exciting, I think. And, and again, I think it's an area that will be really important for it's a big deal. It's an area that I think will be really important for our, our Bright Start partners and other uh, advocates across the state to weigh in. And here is a question. I've got a question here uh, from Beth Lackey. Hey, Beth. From Knoxville, um, is this somewhere where a TEIS contact referral could be made? TEIS, what's TEIS is our that's our Tennessee Early Intervention Services. Oh yeah, oh yeah, you can totally. That's a great example. Um, you can coordinate and collaborate with uh, early intervention specialists. Absolutely. Um, I think I want to uh, speak to one thing that. Blair mentioned, when the money goes out by certificate or contract, even if you get a 15% or 20% bump, bump, bump up in that per child rate, it may not cover the cost of bringing in early intervention or better supporting the teacher in the classroom to meet the needs of all children because it's not enough funding in the program to have that extra aid or you know extra yeah. assistant teacher. And so what a contract does is really um, allows an opportunity to better look at the cost of what not, you might want to see happen in that classroom and then fund it. And certificates can't do that. Um, not unless everybody in the classroom has a certificate, which is very unlikely. You know, on average, you might have 20% or fewer kids in a program whose care might be paid for a subsidy. So uh, in many, it's fewer than that. So even though every now and then you might have a program with in a very low income area with 80% of the kids on subsidy, that's not generally what you see across communities. You see them with a handful of kids whose care might be paid for a subsidy. So the contract enables you to do more because it's an agreement with that program that in this classroom, you want X to happen. And you can do that based on what you think the cost of that would be, not a flat 15% increase. 
right. Um, and this this per, next thing, this prospective payments is uh, this is a big deal. This is a huge deal. It's a great deal for um, providers. Yeah. Um, and so prospective payments, it requires states to pay providers either prior to the delivery of services or at the beginning of services. Why? Because most states, quite frankly, do it on a reimbursement basis. You know, within three weeks of a child attending, there's an invoice that's sent, then that's, you know, another period of time when that invoice is processed by an agency and then paid. But reimbursement- yeah, actually in Tennessee, Grace, in Tennessee, we are, our DHS has, has been working, you know, towards trying to be more provider friendly on this and have implemented a kind of weekly payment arrangement, but it's still That's not good. the same as having prior. And so this, this will be an improvement. Yep. No, the weekly is certainly much better than a lot of states are doing. Yeah. Um, so that's great to hear. But what this is saying is, hey, the law says that you should really mirror private pay practices to the extent possible. And you want to do that because you want to, frankly, incentivize programs to, to serve kids who, you know, are paid uh, with a subsidy. And you want to provide stability for that program so they have the money at the beginning of the month to pay staff, pay their mortgage, utilities, you know, rent, uh, materials, you know, the cost of running that program. Because programs don't pay their bills. They don't reimburse the utility. They don't reimburse, you know, the mortgage holder or the rent landlord, right? You know, bills are due at the beginning of the month. So what this really does is strengthen the ability of programs to have that budget to meet their monthly needs, as opposed to potentially living on credit. And when the state finally pays you, you know, then being able to pay your bills. That's not how the private market works. That's not how private pay parents pay for care. And this will uh, strengthen the business practices of the program. So they have that money at the beginning of each month to make sure they can pay their bills and pay their staff. Um, that will be a change for states because most states have some kind of software system that runs their billing. So they're going to have to change that. Um, subsidy right. paid on enrollment. I think Blair told me that Tennessee already does this. We actually do. We have been doing this since October of 2019. Um, the subsidy paid on enrollment, and that is uh, that's great. So we're not. This won't uh, be any kind of stretch or effort for for our state. So uh, kudos to our Department of Human Services for that. I think that's big kudos. Huge. And again, this is a program stability thing. Private pay. When you're paying for your child to have child care services, if your kid gets pink eye and is out four or five days, you are still paying because that teacher in the classroom still needs to be paid. So subsidies should work the same way. So kudos to Tennessee for already doing it. Um, Grace, we and, also have a, we have a question in the chat from Jenny White. Sure. Um, and the, the question really is about, um, would this allow families to choose from private schools as well? You mentioned high quality early education. And yes, in fact, the subsidy... Um, uh, the subsidy program and the voucher pro reimbursement program um, is for all Department of Human Services licensed providers. And that includes, you know, uh, uh, many, many private sector community-based providers, so some of which are at schools. There are some specific rules around that, that that I probably wouldn't try to get into on this call, but that's... Um, but uh, it has to be a D. These are for DHS licensed providers, uh, right. most of whom are private sector. Right. Um, I think the answer to that is how you define private sector. Community based providers are all private sector. That's right. If you were a private school, let's say a Catholic elementary school, and you have a pre K, um, then that would be a question for the state as far as who oversees and monitors that, what rules they might have to comply with. The Child Care and Development Block Grant Law is pretty specific. There's maybe 10 or so minimum health and safety rules. You have to meet those in order to be approved by you know, the state to serve children on subsidy. So if that private school meets those rules and is certified by the state, then they could be among the choices you know, for parents. But if they don't, um, then they wouldn't be in that universe. you know. Uh, there has to be a background check and you have to meet health and safety standards. And as long as you do, then you can be approved by the state and be among the choices for parents. Right. All right. Um, keep us moving, Grace, just for time's okay. sake. 
So this one uh, little provision that's clarified, um, there were some states that were not certain on whether they could pay providers a rate that exceeded their private pay rate. Let's say, um, you know, the private pay rate is $150 a week. And there were some states that said, oh, okay, then we can never pay subsidy more than that 150 because that's what the provider, you know, charges. And this rule clarifies, no, that's not what we're seeing. If you want to increase the quality, you want to build supply, you want to better reflect the cost of providing care, then um, you are not constrained by what the local market may show. And I can give you a quick example. If you're in a low-income community and parents can only afford $75 a week, you may only charge that. And it really banks on you know paying minimum wage to your workforce. What the rule is saying is no, you're, you, may, you may be in a low-income market and the rates may be artificially low. That makes it impossible to pay staff a decent wage. That makes recruiting and retaining staff super hard. We are gonna allow you with subsidy to go above to reflect the cost of providing care. And so that's a big change to clarify for states that they don't have to cap the subsidy payment at whatever that local market rate might be. That's huge. We talk it a is. lot about cost of quality yeah. and, and we know we know that challenge that we are not paying at the actual cost of quality. Our reimbursement rates are not there yet. And, and the, the, the challenge uh, across the board with paying at the rate of cost of quality is parents just, you know, the limit of parents' pocketbooks to pay uh, for what quality actually costs um, and what quality actually costs really important and the key driver is the rate of payment and the compensation to the workforce which which then end up getting um, you know unfortunately uh, much lower than than is warranted right okay so on this slide we're going to talk about expanding access to subsidy and reducing bureaucracy and so the first bullet says presumptive eligibility and what the rule clarifies, is that states can choose to use presumptive eligibility um, before they get full documentation and verification. And they can do so for three months. And what that means, for example, is that when somebody applies for childcare, maybe the family already re SNAP, received SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or maybe they receive Medicaid, or maybe they receive um, another income you know, means-tested program. Um, HHS is saying to states, don't make it a barrier that every time they may qualify for something, they have to drag out the eight documents to prove that they're low income and where they live and, you know, everything about them. Because sometimes families are eligible, but they flunk out of that paperwork process. They could maybe eventually provide it all. But what this is saying is if they've already provided it, use it states. Let's, let's bring some common sense to you know, the process and make it easier for families to access. You know, Grace, this, this reminded yeah. me too, just on presumptive eligibility. So what what is the eligibility here in Tennessee? And the eligibility, the federal government allows for the funds to be used for families with incomes up to 85% of state median income. And our state, Tennessee, is at the maximum. So in Tennessee, our smart steps program there are other there are other uh, participants in our voucher program but the primary program is a smart steps program based on income eligibility and, and has some work requirements associated with it it is uh, all the way up to 85 percent of state median income and that is capped by the federal government it is capped at the federal government by the federal government but you know it, it's awesome that tennessee does that states are all over the board at what that eligibility level is and to see you know, Tennessee taking full advantage of what they can do under the federal law is awesome. That means more families who need help can get it. Um, so both presumptive eligibility and eligibility simplification are really trying to bring some common sense to the process. If you already qualify for a program, can you use those documents, you know, to prove that you're eligible for the child care program? What can you do states to make accessing the program easier? And that's what simplification 
and presumptive eligibility are about. Um, the next one, additional children in the family. Hey, that Grace, again, we've got a question yeah. coming in here from Debbie sure. Simpson um, sure. and one from Jennifer Andrews. Debbie's asking, would tuition for college coursework and early childhood education be a part of this? The goal to increase knowledge and skills of those who work with children and enhance the opportunities for child care providers. A lot of the training required for child care providers in Tennessee is online training. That does not provide the provider with the transcript. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know why actually you don't get documentation if you complete an online training. You should. Um, yeah. Interesting. I'm not, I'm not sure how to answer that part of it because um, if you take it online, usually there's some kind of uh, Q&A toward the end or in the middle or to proceed to the next section. And if you don't get a certain number correct, you don't move forward. So there are ways to document completion of that. Yeah. Um, but with regard to, you know, does the new rule impact whether a state pays to get a CDA or whether a state pays, um, you know, to get an AA in early childhood or BA in early childhood? The rule doesn't go to that. But um, under current law and the current rule, the new rule kind of adds on to the current rule. So the current rule clearly allows, aligned with the law, that there are certain things you can do with equality set aside. Um, when states receive money from the federal government for childcare, they have to put aside 12% of that money for what they call quality related activities. Professional development of the workforce, including um, encouraging and paying for, you know, CDA or helping with tuition support um, or even child care for someone to take higher ed coursework and progress and complete it. Yeah. Those are all allowable expenses out of the quality set aside. So, yeah, and Grace, you yeah. know, something I'll mention about Tennessee, we have a we have a pretty robust um, sort of support, tuition support, uh, financial support system for education and training through TECTA in Tennessee, the Tennessee, okay. gosh, somebody from TECTA may be on the call here. Uh, Belva Weathersby is our, our colleague and partner um, and heads up TECTA. We've got a lot of a lot of great TECTA folks around the state. So there's some, TECTA provides, and they are based at our community colleges, and they provide a lot of resources to help get your CDA, to help yeah. um, get college tuition. And we also are rich in resources here in Tennessee in terms of our Tennessee Promise and Tennessee Reconnect program that pays for community college. And we also have some higher education scholarships. And we, we actually have a document on that, Jonathan, that we put together at, for our Bright Start Align Summit that maybe we'll include that out with the resource materials when we, when we send back out. And then, oh gosh, okay, got a lot of new questions coming. So Grace, we're going to do these questions and then we're probably going to need to speed because we're at 12.08. So um, we got a question on presumptive eligibility from Jennifer Andrews. Would presumptive eligibility change anything for Tennessee? Could this also be a grace period for proving employment or school enrollment? It's a good question. I think we, um, what is currently going on in Tennessee? You know, the, what I'm told by DHS is that they're exploring, you know, opportunities uh, along these lines to uh, use other benefit program documentation to enroll families. And I think, um, I think, you know, there's some opportunity for strengthening uh, what we're doing in Tennessee there, Jennifer. And then Olivia Abernathy, from experience, the work requirements and proof of residency requirements for eligibility can be pretty narrow and prohibitive. Uh, well, on the um, work requirements, I mean, that's an example of state flexibility, right? You know, some states say, well, you got to be working 80 hours a month. Others say you have to spend, you know, you have to be working 20 hours a week. Others, like I live in Virginia, um, they allow looking for work to count. So you don't actually have to be employed 20 hours a week. If you're actively engaged in looking for work and you're income eligible, you can get subsidy. So those are state decisions. Yeah. And we can certainly get the information out about that in terms of what are our decisions, what are our rules around that currently at the state. Um, Zoe Matthews says educators get certificates for online training, but not college credit. Thank you, Zoe. 
um, Jessica McWilliams, educators working in a licensed facility can attend a TECTA orientation and then receive tuition support from TECTA as well as assisting with the CDA. Thank you, Jessica. Yes, reference to our great TECTA programs. And then Debbie, certificates, Debbie Simpson again, certificates do not translate into an academic credit should the provider want to pursue a degree. Some Just some great comments in here. If anybody wants to, you know, look into the chat, some great comments uh, and conversations happening here. Um I'm also um, glad because I can see the chats up to 17 questions. <laughs> yeah, that's I'm great. I'm also glad to follow up this with a Q&A document that maybe Blair can post, you yeah, know, somewhere I think we'll need follow to, up yeah. with the slides. A lot of good comments going on. A lot that of knowledgeable good. folks on our call too. Cool. That's great. All so right. So just know children and the family. I think this is really important. So what this clarifies, what this is saying is you may have a family with a child and that child whose care is paid for with subsidy that subsidy is good for 12 months. But then let's say the mom has another baby um, and that baby in the household, income qualified, could also qualify for 12 months. This is trying to restore common sense to the process that 12 months is a minimum. So the first child, let's say they're five months in to receiving subsidy uh, and then the new child is added, you could actually extend that subsidy you know, to 15 or 16 months for the first child, rather than having that mom recertify for each child with a different time frame. I mean, that's an administrative nightmare. It's a hassle for the family. So what HHS is saying is, hey, states, you know, if you want, look at the 12 months as a minimum, and you can streamline it for all the children in the family, regardless of when each child started to receive childcare subsidy. So that's in the common sense bucket. Um, online applications, basically, it encourages states to use online applications. I think Blair told me Tennessee already does. Develop screening tools like an online calculator to calculate whether a family would be eligible or not. It requires states, and Tennessee might already do this, to make sure that when you're applying for subsidy and recertifying for subsidy benefits, that it's not going to disrupt your ability you know, to work so that to the extent practicable, you're not putting burdens on the family to have to take off from work, to have to wait in line for several hours, to have to drag in all those documents, to recertify, to show what they already qualified for, you know, 12 months before. So again, this is just aligning with the law because that's actually what the law says. Don't disrupt employment to make this happen. Figure out a way to make it easy for families. That's right. And our state's really, uh, I know, I know our, our DHS team has put a priority on that and been working to make sure that online application is working well and helps families. This last blue box is really saying, hey, states, you know, just keep in mind some of these activities like updating your software for the prospective payments that can come out of your quality funds, can come out of your, you know, regular child care funds. You don't have to put it as an admin cap, how much you can spend on admin. These aren't admin things. If there are staff out there who help families apply for subsidy, that's not admin. That's case support services. So that can come out of, you know, your regular child care money. Doesn't have to be under the admin cap. Oh, okay. I think this might be the last one other than the question All slide. Right. So for criminal background checks, um, there, I think, was confusion across the various states. It's very clear. Fingerprint check against state records, federal records, uh, check of the child abuse registry, check of the sex offender registry. Some of those things are, you know, those things are very hard and fast and clear. But what they clarified was, look, when you submit the prints, that's not the okay for someone to go work in child care. You have to have the results back. It can be one of the two fingerprint checks, the federal check or the state check, but it doesn't have to be both. And it doesn't have to be, you know, every check, as long as you're working in a supervised way. But just because you submitted the information, like the fingerprint, or in the case of the child abuse registry, it's a name check. Just because you submitted the information, that's not good enough to work in child care. You have to get, you know, a result back. Not necessarily complete, it's, you know, across each category, as long as you're supervised. But don't just uh, hire people because they submitted their uh, necessary information. They actually have to have a result back. Second, only states make eligibility decisions, not individual programs. And third, 
apparently child pornography is defined differently among the states. And sometimes it's a misdemeanor and sometimes it's a felony and different, you know, definitions for it. So what HHS has said is child pornography, we don't care if states how you define it. If there's a child, you know, pornography um, uh, uh, charge and someone's found, you know, convicted, then that is a disqualifying offense, regardless of whether in your state it's a misdemeanor or a felony. Um, last on this one, which is part of the market rate survey, every three years, in addition to the state plan, which is how you explain the rules and policies you apply to how you're going to use that federal child care money, um, states are required to do a market rate survey, you know, go out to uh, providers and get back information about prices uh, for each age group and for each setting, like center-based uh, providers or home-based providers. What HHS is saying, hey, look, you are also now going to be required to collect information about whether providers are charging in addition to the copay. So I said there's the subsidy, then there's the family copay, and that together may be below what the market rate is. Hopefully not. Hopefully states are doing a better job of supporting uh, you know, choices for parents by paying high enough rates. But if they're not, they want to know uh, as part of the market rate survey report, what that delta is. If providers are charging between the private pay rate and the subsidy rate and how much that is. So that will be newly required to be part of the market rate survey. Um, and last, major renovation, how that was defined was super confusing to all states. Like, you know, it had to do with previously well, you're moving a load-bearing wall, you know, what type of structural change is it? And every state was interpreting it differently and it was kind of a gray area. And so the whole major renovation definition has now been redefined and it's based on the cost of renovations. So uh, major renovation is prohibited. Construction is prohibited under the federal law. And that's why this major renovation definition is so important. But what this is saying is, hey, if it's a renovation of 350,000 or less for a center, it's not a major renovation. If it's 50,000 or less for a family chocolate home, it's not a major renovation. And these amounts would be adjusted in, by inflation. So this is a uh, opportunity for states to help strengthen and improve programs with, um, helping providers with their facility needs, which is super important to the health and safety of children. So I will stop there and just say, uh, Cindy Cisneros, Tia Collier, and I, we are the early childhood team at CED. And I'm glad to answer any questions other than the 20 that are already in the chat or Blair, fire them away. And I'm good with that. Awesome. Thank you, Grace. That's fantastic. We'll do questions. I want to do a quick uh, a quick couple of notes on what's next for input into the CCDF plan. There are um, there are a couple of steps, one of which is already underway, which is a set of focus groups that Department of Human Services has put together primarily for providers. Um, the actual last one of those, there were three. Uh, March 11th, March 12th, and the last one is tonight between 6 and 7 Central Time, 6 and 7 p.m. Central Time. We will certainly put that in the uh, in the chat. Um, following that, though, there will be a process over the next uh, really two to three months, um, April and May, where there will be um, an opportunities for communication through email. Um, about specifics. You can outline the specifics of what you'd like to see, or you could have an email from your group um, that you could coordinate and organize and have people sign off on if you want to give it more punch. Um, but to, to weigh in on these things, and it'll give you a little bit more time uh, to kind of consider and reflect and review some of the materials we provided for you today. And then there will also be a set of hearings, public hearings you can attend in person, and then there will be um, uh, some kind of final review of the plan, and then it will be submitted uh, right at the, at the end of June. Um, the three-year plan will be submitted at the end of June. So we're, we're planning to get all that information back out to you, but Jonathan was uh, was just reminding me just about there was a focus group tonight. It is uh, intended primarily for providers, but I, I think it is uh, 
Jonathan's going to put that in the chat. If anybody is able to attend it, it's between 6 and 7 p.m. Central Time, uh, and it's, uh, you know, virtual. So, so a couple that, things on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would ahead. just say super quickly. One, um, it is required for states to fill out the template from HHS, which then becomes their state plan. It's a state plan template. This template is 118 pages. I can send Jonathan a link to it if anybody wants to take a look through what types of questions are asked as part of the state plan, because that might help you think, how can I impact this? What do I hope the answer will be? What is the policy currently? What could the policy be, like options for states? Um, second, there will be public hearings, at least one. And the reason for that is, um, yes, because every state wants to have input from the community, but also it's required by federal law. So they must check that box. Yes, we've held one or more. They must say when the date of those hearings were so that there's public transparency to this per to this process. And last, that state plan is due July 1. So, you know, if you want to take a look at the state plan, I'll send the link to Jonathan. He can send it around with the slides and I now see there's 20 questions in the chat, Blair. I don't know what you want to do, but I'm glad to answer anything or follow up in writing. Yes, we will do both. Um, if we can't get to them today, we will do both. And there are 20 in the chat, though. I think we've gotten through most of these questions. Um, let's see if there are any additional ones. I think a lot of this was some conversation back and forth. Um, anybody want to ask a question? Feel free, raise your hand. Jonathan, you can just ask it out loud. Uh, you don't have to put it in the chat. Anybody uh, Anybody got anything you want to say or comment on or question? Anyone? I Believe it or not, I always have a question. Um, I love it. A quick question. So if a parent receives vouchers for child care from infancy until the child goes to kindergarten, does that impact the vouchers that they could use for aftercare once the child reaches school age? No. Um, if they're still income eligible for the program, it's pretty. it should be pretty seamless. The, okay. They could use that subsidy for before and after care as long as wherever it is that they want to go, you know, is regulated, monitored in some way and meets those minimum health and safety standards and that mm -hmm. the people working in the program have passed a background check. Those are kind of the general requirements, but there are plenty of, you know, before and after school programs that are on that state certified list or state, you know, licensed list. And so it the subsidy does not stop because some child has entered kindergarten. It should be seamless. But that program should be DHS certified and take CCDF vouchers. Is that correct? I just want to make sure I'm understanding yeah. that right. Yeah. I mean, how it generally works is, let's say you're running a before and after care program, right? Maybe it's located in a school, maybe it's at the Y, maybe it's somewhere else. Um, depending on the state, you may or may not need a license, but you will, as a subsidy vendor, have to meet those health and safety standards and have to meet the background check requirements. So usually there's a vendor agreement with the state. Mm -hmm. And so they might not use the word license, like some states, for example, they don't license public schools, um, but there might be a comparable monitoring process. So there's a vendor agreement. Um, and if you, you know, if a program meets those minimum health and safety requirements and staff are background checked, then, you know, the vendor agreement would be with the state to authorize the care of children to use your facility. Yeah. And I see, so, and my question, thank you for that explanation, because that helps a little bit. Um, I saw somebody said, but Families First only allows 60 months of usage. Thank you, Olivia. I just, that's what I TANF ran into. TANF program in Tennessee, Grace. That's the TANF yeah. program. Okay. And TANF does, um, is another funding stream for uh, for child care. And our, and our families that are part of the Families First program, there are special rules that are not the same as the CCDF rules right. related to participation in the Families it, First program. It can be an accounting thing. I mean, this can be a question you could have a discussion with the state about, mm -hmm. but let's say you're in families first. Now, I don't know the rules for that, but let's say that's, you know, from birth to age five or age six, whatever it might be. Um, there should be, if it comes out of one pot of money, let's say TNF, 
then you could be switched to another pot of money, you know, the child care and development fund money. Um, I will also say um, that many states transfer money from TANF over to child care. So it could be some of that funding. And there's maintenance of effort money. Those That's requirements in order to use the federal funds. You have to spend a certain amount of money, like for TANF. This is way outdated, but it's still the law. Um, you have to be spending at least the same amount that you spent in 1995. <laughs> that was part of the 1996 welfare reform law. And so part of that maintenance of effort, maybe it's that money that's used to pay for certain families, but there are you know different funding streams. Um, and so Families First doesn't cover it. My question would be to ask the state how to provide seamless assistance to families who might otherwise have enjoyed help from that program so that the parent can continue to work and the child can continue to have access to high quality care. Awesome. Well, with that, that is a great way to end. Um, I want to thank Grace so much for her time with us. I want to thank you all for spending uh, a little time with us as well today to, to dig in on this uh, topic. And Cindy, I'm not putting you in the spot, but I see Cindy Cisneros in our, in our, uh, audience today. And I just want to thank her. She leads the education division for uh, the Committee for Economic Development of the Conference Board and has been a great colleague and friend to TQE for a long time. Hi, Cindy. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, back to you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for, for participating with all these great questions. Thank you, Grace, for, for the wealth of information. Uh, it's always fun to learn so much uh, from you in this. Before you all hop off of here, if you haven't done so already, please check the chat uh, take the 60 second survey. It shouldn't take any longer than that. Helps us to make this content relevant for you as we move forward, um, knowing kind of how we uh, frame the, this time for the lunch and learn. So please do that. And if you haven't done so already, also there's a link in the chat to the next um, lunch and learn. So this is where we're going to learn a little bit more about the Department of Human Services, the grant opportunity that they've got coming up that's new. I uh, would love to have you guys uh, plug in and learn more about that as well. Uh, I think that wraps us up. Again, thank you so much, Grace, for your time and energy and effort in putting this together for us and helping us to understand this. We will be following up with all of you with a um, email that has a recording of this, but also has a um, all the links that we've talked about uh, throughout this presentation. So appreciate all of you and keep up the good work that you all are doing. And we will see you all hopefully in a couple of weeks. Thanks. Bye-bye. And send me the questions, Jonathan. <laughs>